Well, good morning and welcome to our video today. My name is Peter Frank. I am the Senior Manager here at Concordia Technology Solutions. And we are going to try a, another time to do this live interview with Laura Horn about why your church should have a blog. We tried it last Thursday and had technical difficulties and that just seems to be a continuing problem that we have with our live video. And so we're considering other options, but we're going to try to move forward today and, and have this conversation. So please bear with us if we do have technical difficulties, um, but I think we're all set. So um, Laura is joining us from sunny San Diego. I'm assuming it's sunny there because San Diego seems to always be sunny. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> you are a freelance um, writer and um, let's see what else we have. Web strategist. I d was thrown off by our technical difficulties. I didn't get that all memorized correctly. But um, Laura, how are you doing today, first off? Doing great. And the sun just broke through the, um, the clouds. It's usually cloudy in the morning and then it just kind of brightens up. So, <laughs> Well, that is awesome. <laughs> I have only been out to San Diego once, although it's looking like I might be coming out again in the spring for a conference, so I'm hoping that will oh, work excellent. out. So, um, well, Laura, thanks for your patience with um, all the technology issues that we've had, and um, you were able to join us minutes before we started, so we haven't had a chance to um, kind of plan this out, but I'm excited to talk to you about this idea of blogs for churches. It's something that we've talked about a lot here at Concordia Technology Solutions, and we've done a number of things over the years, but it's been probably about a year and a half, two years since we've really dug into this topic, and we haven't talked to you about it yet. So I'm excited to hear your thoughts on this. Um, you wrote a blog post for the Concordia Technology blog that we launched last Tuesday, and um, really just gets mm -hmm. into both the why, but also the how. And, and you mentioned in there that it's always good to um, talk about the how first before getting into the why. So it looks like we just lost Laura for a second. So we'll wait for her to come back on um, before we ask her to answer the question. Um, but this idea of asking how can kind of make it easier as you get into the why. Because while starting a blog may seem like a big project and may seem difficult, it's not actually as difficult as it seems. So, Laura, we've got you back here now. Um, can you start <laughs> off? Let's start off talking about just the website platform. What is needed um, for a website platform for a blog? Is it a super fancy kind of web platform, or can anybody do it? Well, just about anybody can do it. And if your church already has a website, then um, you should pretty much have what you need. If not, then you know you can go with um, launching a blog that would also have the ability to host the information about your church too. So <clears throat> it's really not that hard. Let's talk about, you mentioned this idea of a purpose statement for a blog. What is that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you go about writing a purpose statement for the blog? A purpose statement defines what the blog is about, so it's not all over the place. Um, if you have a blog for the church, you want to define what it's about, what it's, um, what you're going to write about, and what you're not going to write about. For instance, um, you know, are you going to have church politics on there? Probably not. Most churches really don't. <laughs> um, you're not going to probably have rant, political rants or things like that. Um, um, as a matter of fact, I'd recommend you didn't because of legalities, but, um, you know, basically it's supposed to show the life of the church and feed the people who are members, but also give outsiders a glimpse into what, what your church is about, you know, um, devotions, events, um, things that you're passionate about, um, activities going on, um, current things going on with the Sunday school, all sorts of things that show what does your church love? What is it about? What does it believe? And um, so it feeds everybody who comes. Okay, so let me go a little off our pre-prepared questions here to ask that the difference between the website and the blog. If you can do a blog mm -hmm. on pretty much any website and it's about the life of the church, what distinguishes the blog from the website? Usually the information that's on the front page of the website is fairly static. It doesn't change. Um, it, it's your address, um, your, your service times, 
And, you know, it also can have articles listed on it that people can link to, and those might change. But generally, that's fairly consistent. The blog is something that changes on a regular basis. And that's good both because it's showing that things are going on with the church, but also because it shows Google that things are going on. So you also tend to rank a little bit better when your your website is active. That's a very good point. And I think especially in today's age of social media, we can tend mm-hmm. to downplay our website and the importance, but really most web experiences, um, short of social media directly, start with a web search, mm-hmm. and that's all around SEO. So I think that's a very good point. Thanks for bringing that up. So blogs mm-hmm. constantly changing show the, the latest and, and greatest, if you will. How do you go about finding people to write? Um, I'm sure that many of our pastors or other church workers are thinking, I don't have time to take on another big project. <laughs> What is your suggestion? No doubt. For, <laughs> you understand. <laughs> you're, you've got that experience there. But what is it that, you know, how do you go about finding writers for it? Is it supposed to be the pastor? Is it supposed to be the church staff? Or can it be anyone at the church? I think it's a good idea that the pastor be one of the writers because, I mean, it's his job to preach and teach. And um, the blog can be a great tool for that. It also connects the people who are reading the blog with the pastor. However, he doesn't have to be the only one. Um, You know, basically, if you find a few volunteers who are willing to go with the purpose of of the blog, and then you have maybe one person who's kind of coordinating everything, who helps put together um, a list of things that you're going to write about, they call it a content calendar. You know, you just know, okay, this week, we're going to talk about, um, you know, starting Sunday school up again for, um, for the school year. We're going to, and then next week we're going to talk about this. And then October comes around. Let's talk a little bit about Reformation Day. Um, we've got an Oktoberfest coming up. Different things like that. Um, then, you know, those are things that don't necessarily require the pastor to write about. Those can be people who are in the church, who are willing to give an hour here or there, um, maybe once a month to write a blog post about something that's important to the church. And so if you find a few people that do that, then you have someone that's willing to write once a month rather than all the time. That's great. Now, how do you go about starting that conversation? And it's, maybe it's two conversations. One is the conversation with the leadership of a church on having a blog, and two, it's those blog authors. What are your recommendations <laughs> for starting that conversation? I think it's good that you mentioned the leadership of the church because since this isn't just the pastor's blog, this is a blog that reflects the life of the church, they should be on board, um, and they should you know, know what the purpose is, buy into the purpose and be able to support you for that. Um, Then also, you know, I think, you know, your congregation, you know, if someone, um, you know, if you think about it, you pray about it, a a few people might stand out and then you bring it up to them. Well, and it's a certain kind of gift that people have for writing that you don't often have that opportunity to use in the church unless you're in the church office Mm -hmm. putting together the bulletin or the newsletter or updating the website. And so I think it creates a unique opportunity for people like yourself, who is a writer, to use those gifts Mm -hmm. to help the church. Now, before we get into the why, are there any other hows that are important for our audience to understand with starting a blog? Anything else that you recommend they dig into before um, before they put, post their first blog post? Like I said, I mean, basically have a purpose that everyone buys into. Um, a good idea is a content calendar so that you know a month or two out what you're writing about and what's going on in the life of the church in those couple of months. So you can plan that and then fill in other things around it. Um, I would also, um, you know, figure out, okay, who's writing what? Um, And then I think you can pretty much go ahead from there. I mean, if you have a page set up on your your website um, for that, then you probably, the person who has taken the lead on it or who's the editor can also um, edit those posts. 
Looks like we lost Laura for a second there. We'll come back on. I'm sure she'll come back on in a second. I really like this approach of talking about the how before the why. Because so often when you can get excited about the why, but the practical details of how get in the way and cause fear and cause excuses for not doing it. And I know for me personally, finding excuses is really easy. Um, but by talking about this <laughs> how and, and seeing how easy it can be, it really removes those excuses and then the why just comes into play. So sorry we lost you there during the right. middle of your last answer. Was there anything else you wanted to add before we get into the why? Uh, no, let's, I don't know where we broke off. So. Okay. <laughs> sorry about that. These tech issues are, are just getting frustrating. So, all right, well, let's talk about the why. They can be a pain. <laughs> yes, I sure can. Technology is great if and when it works. But so let's talk about <laughs> why I have a blog, because that's really the most important thing. And um, these how answers really kind of eliminate those excuses. But let's talk about the value of why. So give us a high level summary of why, and then we'll dig into some of those details. Why should a church have a blog? Well, number one, it can be a, a means of reaching um, the, the members of the church during the week with different information, with, um, you know, with spiritual messages, things that can't be covered on Sunday. So it's, it's a way to reach them through that. It also is a way of letting other people see what's important to the life of the church, as we said before. And as we said before, it lets the search engines know that your site is up and active, that it isn't something that was created six months ago and is, isn't really relevant now. So it really provides value for both your members and Google. And, and it's hard, I'm sure, for churches to think about providing value for a search engine. But really, a search engine is the connection point between your uh, potential visitors as well as your members, but especially those who are out seeking. Um, so how, oops, we lost Laura again. Let's go ahead and show the blog post for a second here because Laura posted a number of different ideas um, down here underneath the um, blog provides connection during the week. And she's got this bulleted list. If you scroll down there, you'll see a number of different practical ideas for um, tips on what to write about, um, which really gets back into that why, that connection during the week with members and potential visitors. So. Mm -hmm. Laura, how can a church encourage current visitors to visit, but then um, also how can they encourage potential visitors to visit the blog or potential church members to visit the blog? When you write your blog articles and the things that you're covering, um, you can put in a call to action. You know, our service is at, at nine o'clock on Sunday, um, or we have a midweek service. We'd love it if you join us. If you have any questions, give us a call here. Um, so a great call to action that covers that is something that's good. But it, I think, honestly, when the tone of the blog is something that is a beat and shows the passion of the church, then it actually helps people find the places they belong. I like that because everybody is looking for belonging and the church is a great place to belong. But sometimes it can feel hard to find your fit. And I know that Sunday morning is not usually the best time to get involved because it's about worship. It's about the gifts that Christ gives us, not about what we can give back or what we can do to get involved. It's not about us on Sunday mornings, um, but a blog allows right. us to find those connections. So um, we showed that. I way. think. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of, of my clients that I work with are mental health professionals, and I tell them that their website is their waiting room that it lets people know what's coming it makes them feel comfortable and i guess you know the website of the church should be viewed as the narthex i like that that's a really interesting idea the narthex and then anything that we can do to make sure we're, people are not confused with that sanctuary part of the church and what that is there for i like that idea of the narthex right. where you can get in connected with that community in different ways very good well um 
Oops, we lost Laura again. Laura talked about the content calendar, and we've um, we've talked about content calendars in the past and the value of those, kind of this idea of tent poles where it creates the structure and then kind of fills it out. But I'm really intrigued about this in connection to the blog because we've talked about it in other ways before related to social media, related to newsletters and bulletins. Um, but this idea of the content calendar for your blog um, is exciting mm -hmm. and I think really provides some a good plan forward. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you go about creating a content calendar for the blog um, as opposed to all your other forms of communication? What's unique about that? What's um, What might be easier or more challenging about a content calendar for a blog? <laughs> Probably the challenging part is Pentecost. <laughs> Just going <laughs> through that whole long period of time where <clears throat> Um, Sunday school might be out or other things might not be going on, but then that can be an opportunity for um, a extensive, you know, going into a book of the Bible or something like that um, or highlighting what's coming up with VBS. But a content calendar is something where you look at where are we in the year and in the church year and what's going on. Um, in the congregation. So you can then, you know, know that, gee, this is coming up. So we can write about this here the week before, get people kind of excited about it. And if there's nothing coming up, well, you know, what's what's going up for the for the liturgy? Is there a commemoration day, you know, something like uh, a Lutheran we don't know much about, like Robert Barnes or or something like that. Um, so it just keeps things moving and keeps things in perspective because it would kind of be a bummer to write about um, to write about something like um, the Sunday school as great as the Sunday school is if you have Reformation <laughs> yeah if you are missing the uh, the key parts of the church here or sometimes the, it's not a matter of missing them it's just it's kind of snuck up on you I know that happens for us um, on a regular basis here that there's so many good things to do that these big events can sneak up on us when we could have been planning on in advance. And, and I like that idea with a, a content calendar is that it kind of creates these holes that you can fill. And, and that's mm -hmm. a time when you can really get ahead and, and plan out in advance. So, um, good, we've got you back. Sorry, we lost you again for a moment there, <laughs> Laura. I've only got a couple more questions for you. Um, first off, have you seen any um, really good examples of church blogs that you'd like to share with our audience, or even just the general idea of the blog? We don't have to call them out by name, but what are some good examples <laughs> of blogs by ch other churches? You know, um majority of where I'm what I'm working with it it is hard to get churches to start so there are a few examples that I've seen out there but not many and I think that this is something that we can jump in on and start and start moving because it is so effective with every other area um, with businesses with um, and people who are with services where people are trying to help other people but this is something that um, as far as Lutheran churches, I haven't seen jump forward, but I have seen it more, more effectively in some in some others. But I do think that it's something we can utilize so strongly. Good. My last question for today is for today is not something that I was asking, but a comment that we got on Facebook um, when we shared the blog post was this idea of a pastor's blog versus a church blog. And you had a great answer for right. that. Would you mind sharing that? What the difference is, whether um, a pastor should blog on their own or for their church? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I should say also going back before though, our, my congregation is has been working on a blog and it is going forward and doing a great job. So that's gdlutheran.org. So, um, for Gloria Day Lutheran, so ddlutheran.org. So give that a, you know, check that out because um, um, Heather, our editor, is doing an excellent job with that. But also, um, um, as far as the difference between a pastor's blog and a church blog is, a pastor's blog has been pastor's blog has been around for quite a while. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan. I love pastor's blogs, but they tend to be what the pastor is passionate about, not necessarily what um, the congregation 
is passionate about. Sometimes it's even an avenue to kind of express the passions that he can't necessarily um, share on Sunday with his congregation. So it's a means of, it, it's still a means of reaching the congregation, but it also does tend to focus on the world at large, other pastors, um, laity that are passionate about the same things. And so, you know, they'll talk about all sorts of things. They'll talk about church politics. They'll talk about um, pastoral practice or theological issues. And then, you know, maybe even get into the Greek and, um, or they'll talk about their football team or different things like that. And, and that's all awesome. It, it's wonderful. But um, the pastor takes it with him when he goes, just like. Um, Looks like we lost Laura again. And that idea of um, the pastor's interest too, like I know a lot of pastors who like talking about football or maybe brewing beer. And that's a, a great thing. It shows a hu more human side of the pastor that you don't always see from the pulpit um, because it's not about the pastor at the pulpit. Um, and it can kind of build those personal connections. But those kind of topics are really not appropriate for a church's blog um, that stays there for a long period of time. Um, and so right. I think that's a, a great point. You know, anything that the pastor might um, have as his own personal interest or might want to take with him stays over there. Um, yeah. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add to that, Laura. No, no, I think that basically covered it. Good. Well, that's all the questions I had for you today. And again, I apologize for these technical issues. Um, we are reviewing other options moving forward because this is several weeks in a row now with various different people across the country. So I'm thinking it's more okay. on our end or our services end. So thanks for your patience, Laura, and thanks for our audience's patience as we deal with this and try to figure out a better way of approaching these live videos. Um, but I invite you to tune in this coming Thursday as we have a, another conversation two days from now, actually. It's going to come around real quickly. Um, you may have seen my shirt with this big logo on here today at Concordia Publishing House, the um, organization that Concordia Technology Solutions is a part of. We are beginning our year-long celebration of our 150th anniversary. So today is the 149th birthday of Concordia Publishing House, and we're going to talk with Katie Munson on Thursday about how technology has changed over the years. As we look at CPH, um, kind of always using technology, whatever the latest of the day was, and what we're doing now, we'll talk about how that impacts the church and how technology um, supports the sharing of the gospel. So I invite you to tune in this Thursday at 1130 here on this same Facebook page. Um, but once again, thanks for viewing today. And Laura, thanks for joining us. I appreciate the blog post and we'll share the link to the blog post in the comments. So thanks again. Have a great rest of the day.